Welcome to Inflection Point Podcast, where we cultivate change from the inside out as we ponder the Cairo question. Will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which he was born? We stand on the belief that dismantling racism goes beyond laws and legislation or politics and economics. Here, anti-racism activation is presented presented as an inside job where personal transformation and accountability impact social change. So take a seat at the anti-racism activation table with Inflection Point Podcast. Well, hello, hello, and thank you all for tuning in to the newest episode of Inflection Point Podcast, where we are dedicated to the art of listening in authentic conversation. We challenge our audience to listen actively and intentionally for the purpose of critical self-reflection, in-depth perspective taking, personal transformation, and ultimately social impact. Our 2024 theme explores the art of community conversations in today's climate of systemic and institutional racism, anti-racism activation, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and book banning. I am your host, Anita Russell, and here's a quick hello from co-hosts Mavis and Gail. Hello, everybody. I'm Mavis Bauman. Hi, I'm Gail Hunter, and welcome. Excellent, excellent. So we continue our discussion of the precipice of change. Echoing the words of uh, James Tallarico in his uh, declaration that the political divide is not left versus right, it's top versus bottom. So we've had these really in-depth conversation on grassroots movement, in particular Mm -hmm. women's empowerment as a function of individual action fueled by grassroots uh, empowerment, um, prioritization, democracy. So all of these topics we've been kind of really focused on. We've explored the opportunity economy, leadership, truth, and integrity. And in this particular episode, we dive deep into leadership as a social process, reflecting potential that is all around us, including the potential for justice. We use stories from two specific YouTube channels to demonstrate true leadership through the perspective of action-driven decisions related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And those two YouTube uh, channels, uh, the first one is Nest Stories channel, and we're gonna explore the story of a doctor who, who humiliates a black nurse in front of a patient, unaware of who the patient actually is. And then the second uh, YouTube channel comes from the storyteller. And in that story, we're going to explore a black owner who is kicked out of his own store by a racist manager. So we're gonna get this conversation started by passing the baton over to Gail, and she's gonna walk us through the story about the doctor, the staff and the nurse. All right. So this takes place um, in England at St. Mary's General Hospital, um, which is a fairly affluent suburban community. Uh, And Angel Parker is the nurse's name. And she's a very uh, intelligent and gifted black nurse that uh, joined the staff after completing her education and graduating, I believe, at the top of her class. Um, she had no idea that the deep-seated prejudices that she was going to encounter and the tensions that were going to mount um, would continue to escalate, um, mostly because of, a, of one patient who came into the hospital. He had broken his, both of his arms and in a skiing accident. His name was Thomas Edwards, and nobody really knew who he was, but he was very observant and continued to be observant throughout the entire story. <clears throat> um, People had a sense that he was somebody, but they didn't know exactly who he was. And so I want you, when you listen to this this story, I want you to imagine that you are this nurse and that what she has to go through, you have to go through. Um, And also the coping skills that she has to use. And and then certainly what what comes of the... the, uh, um, of the experience that she's had and and the patient and who the patient is. But just for, for the moments I, I describe what happened to her, 
just imagine that that was happening to you or your, or your daughter. Um, and that the conversations that her mother had to have with her to help her cope uh, were conversations that you also had to have with your children constantly. So um, Dr. Grease is another main character and he was, I'm guessing this is an orthopedic floor and he was an attending on that floor and in charge of everything. Uh, so that uh, once she started at, at the hospital, he definitely was very prejudiced and, and had his eye out to try to set her up um, and to test, to test her in, in some different ways, as did the head nurses. Um, that she was constantly feeling um, that she had to prove herself. She, mm -hmm. There were very subtle dismissals from, um, from different people that um, she wouldn't hear directly, but she could overhear conversations. And it reminded her of when she was in school and some of her professors would raise their eyebrows or when she aced an exam, um, or she'd hear classmates whispering uh, whether she truly belonged and whether she really was that qualified. So this constant background of history of constant questioning her um, intelligence, questioning her ability, was something that she was somewhat used to but didn't expect to meet it at the hospital. Um, so that when she started her job, um, it became a battle against prejudice and preconceptions. Um, what set in motion was a chain of events that would challenge the very foundation of this hospital's culture. Um, and slowly, um, that began to emerge. So what occurred initially was she found herself um, very much being um, set aside, being called to give uh, patients um, that were very difficult. In fact, one was uh, actually overtly racist and to take care of. And she was also required to, to handle the majority of the most difficult cases, more so than any other nurse on the floor. So she was always being expected to perform and to do her best, um, under standards that nobody else in the hospital was being expected to work by. Um, the one patient that came in, as I said, his name was Mr. Edwards, and, and she was assigned to, to work with him, to, to be his nurse, and change bandages and so forth. And she even overheard the nurses outside of his door questioning whether or not she actually had the ability to handle a VIP patient because they knew he was VIP, but they didn't know who he was. So she was dealing with all of this um, stress and all this um, overt and covert um, discrimination and racism at the same time having to handle some very difficult patients. One of the things that occurred, she also had to, was asked by this Dr. Grease to um, assist in a surgery. And during the mm -hmm. surgery, she actually spoke up and told him that she thought that the patient's body would, would prefer a different incision and a different place and location, which was very courageous of her to do that. And, and she was right. And so he did do the, he did the procedure and the, and the incision the way that she suggested it. But afterwards, he really laid into her and um, was extremely intimidating and, and verbally assaulted to her and, um, and very much enraged and was talking to her, which he didn't realize was outside the door of this Mr. Edwards. And Mr. Edwards was overhearing it. He also had been very observant over watching how everyone had also treated her throughout that time. Um, so there are numerous tests that she went through. Her coping skills, um, and, I, and I think it's wonderful that she that her mother was able to teach this to her throughout her life. So she had this to pull upon in all these moments. What's so sad is that she even had to have that conversation with her daughter. And I want you to realize, hopefully realize and see that, that nobody should have to have that conversation with their child. But this mother knew she had to. Um, <clears throat> and so Angela's um, mother would tell her that she, um, she knew she had to, to work twice as hard as everyone else and um, but don't you ever let them see, see you sweat because you come from a long line, a long, strong, a long line of strong women, and you've got the same strength in you. And she said, and, I, and one other time she said, Yeah, now you listen to me. You've worked too hard to let anyone make you feel less than remember what who you are and where you come from. And you're not just there for yourself, you're there for every little black girl who dreams of being in those halls one day. So Angela closed her eyes and letting her mother's words wash over her. 
and say, I know. And so she would behave that way. She would swallow whatever she had to. She would breathe. She would do whatever she had to in order to continue on and persevere through some pretty blatant um, blatant abuse. Um, so her mother's words always would would echo in her in her mind. And that was really her biggest coping skill. Mm -hmm. uh, she um, would often reflect on, on experiences and remind herself of what that she became a nurse in the first place to help people regardless of the background or her own challenges. Mr. Edwards at one point told her that a person's true character is revealed not in how they treat their superiors, but in how they treat those they perceive as beneath them. And she, he observed that Angela never treated anyone with less than, than um, extreme ex respect and, and, and compassion. So after Mr. Edwards heard this conversation between the doctor after the surgery and Angela, he, he called them in to, the, to his room and revealed who he was. Um, and who he was was the chief operating officer of the entire health system in that, in that most of, the, of England. And it's a socialized medicine, so he was pretty high up there. Um, so he told, um, he said that he witnessed a culture of discrimination and unprofessionalism. And he said that it went against everything that he believed in as a healthcare leader. And he went on to describe how he had observed a subtle and not so subtle discrimination against her um, and how she had faced the microaggressions and the overall toxic culture that was permeating that from his perception through the entire hospital experience. And unfortunately, Mr. Edwards said, and his voice was filled with anger and determination that it's unacceptable and ends now. And as they talked, Angela felt a weight lifting off of her shoulders, obviously. What, if, what happened, he called a meeting immediately of everybody in the hospital and told them what he had observed and what he was planning on doing. And he ended up firing the doctor that obviously was at the head of that, that floor. Um, and he made, he put, asked Angela if she would be willing to take on the position of uh, the head of the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion program that he was wanting to set up and to implement everything as soon as possible. And she accepted it. So I think that the story has, many levels of um, and many layers of important information for us all to look at that one person really can make a difference. One person can affect change in a very large system such as that. And that whether you are, however you are doing that and standing up for what is not right, what is not um, acceptable, what is, is not necessary and it's not based on any truth is to be able to say, this isn't okay and to be able to treat everybody with the same level of kindness and respect um, and do the work that you need to within yourself in order to, to shift from where the nurses and that Dr. Grease was into certainly where this Mr. Edwards has been in his life um, is the goal for every one of us uh, that, um, that wears white skin, right? That we all need to listen to this. So that's basically the... The whole premise of the of the story it was a fascinating story and, and obviously very heartwarming and had a great conclusion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen all the time, does it? So, any comments from from Anita, from you, or Mavis? Well, I would just like to comment mm -hmm. on the coping strategies because that was one of the things that really, really jumped <clears> out to <throat> me yeah. when I initially watched the video and I watched it multiple times just to make sure that I was absorbing um, the different elements and everything. But that was the thing that really, really struck me is her coping strategies. And I'm saying that for a couple of reasons. Number one is just for folks out there to understand that this is something that we develop is these coping strategies, uh, particularly when you're faced with being in an environment, a situation that you've worked to be in. Right. She went to school. She got the education. Right. She performed well and all of that. So she deserved to be in that space, just like anybody else in that in that hospital deserved to be in that space. But when you're when when um, you have that under your belt, but then you're still being put in a position, I think in one point of the video, they even refer to her as a diversity hire. 
I mean, how insulting is that? Right, like right. I've worked hard mm-hmm. to get to where I am. But the thing that struck me the most was it was her mother that had given her the advice. And the reason it um, rings so well with me is because I can remember the mother, the, uh, the advice that I got from my mom when I was developing my career. And one of the things that my mother told me is that you never let white people see you sweat. You just never give them this air that, or give them the impression, I should say, that they've gotten the best of you, that they have gotten, um, that they have pushed you in a corner that you can't get out of, right? And I think it's interesting when you think about the story because they kept trying to make things more and more and more difficult for her. And she overcame every aspect that they were pushing at her. She was able to push uh, beyond that. And so a lot of that is is related to these coping strategies that she's probably been taught most of her life, the same way that I was taught them most of my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that the thought that she was in that surgeon, that OR, and was able to speak up when she knew the doctor was going to make a grave error um, speaks to her courage, I mean, overall, mm-hmm. and that she has been learning from the time she was born yeah, you know, not to let anybody see, as as her mother said, sweat. Um, but the reality is that that's that's not okay. That you that she even had to have that that coping skill, right? I mean, I think that's the real issue that that I know, and and couples and parents that I've worked with with kids who are black, and and that I kept thinking that no parent should have to have those conversations with their kids. You know, you're truly treat, teaching them how to stand up to a bully, and um, which is what's happened, right? In many different ways, from the hor- horrific ways to the, the microaggressions. Um, yeah. They shouldn't exist at all. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. Well, this is uh, the first time I ever heard that, that these coping strategies were taught in this way by Black parents, to their children. I mean, the the strategies that I would say I learned was just behave yourself, you know. But if a, a Black person escalates in an environment like that, they're labeled so quickly, angry, you know, scary, all of these things they don't deserve because their reaction is justified. This nurse's reaction was justified. And they were really kind of suppressing her gifts by constantly badgering her and diminishing her. So um, I just find that uh, Mm. enlightening. Well, at the same time, they were also putting her in positions where she had to work with the most difficult patients. That um, So it was like that contrast, right? Um, They wanted her to fail. Somebody wanted her to fail, right? Yeah, they did, yeah. yeah. Or to even look at it deeper, they expected her to fail. Ah, yeah. They had an expectation that she was going right, exactly. to fail. Yeah. yeah, so it's just a, a really <clears throat> yeah. interesting story. But, you know, we're presenting it as this story, but these types of things happen the in the workplace on a regular basis. So mm-hmm. it's not, and like I said, the things that my mother taught me mm-hmm. um, and how to cope with different things that uh, crop up in, in the workplace. And um, you you just have to know how to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think also one coping strategy is not allowing other people to diminish how you see yourself, mm-hmm. right? You have to be the one that holds on to what your, your vision is, your, um, your goals are and all of that and not allow someone else and their limited way of looking at you to limit how you look at yourself. Right. Yeah. You have to be very strong inside and really know who you are and what your name is. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to know what is your identity. Is your identity. Yeah. 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 And so I think at this point, we'll flip the conversation over to uh, Mavis, and she's going to present a another story that has some similar elements. So we'll explore that and also have a conversation afterwards. Mm-hmm. Great, great. So uh, this story uh, will also demonstrate some pretty 
uh, serious coping strategies. It's about a Black owner of a luxury chain, a clothing chain that is all the way across the U.S. from New York to Los Angeles. He's worked very hard to become the owner of this chain of stores. He's born to working class parents in Harlem. And from the time he was born, he remembers facing, facing prejudice you know, at a very early age. He understood that his skin color carried with it a set of assumptions that mm. others imposed on him without hesitation. Teachers you know, wanted to tamp down his sense of self by saying, why don't you strive for something more realistic when he, you know, started to share his ambitions. The classmates mocked him for that because they assumed he could never rise above his circumstances. Um, uh, Darius, with his name is Darius Blackwell, and he had the unyielding support of his parents that pushed him past those limitations. And he rose to the ranks of the business world first as a young, hungry entrepreneur, then as a titan of these luxury retail um, stores. He, this is a sad thing, he, that he learned that success could never completely shield him from the ugliness of racism, despite owning a multi-million dollar company. He was still often viewed as skepticism about his wealth and his status was scrutinized. Um, he, more than celebrated, he had learned to expect subtle, insidious discrimination. Yeah, and that often came cloaked in politeness. I just mm -hmm. choke on those words because, you know, we can think of a million examples of that. And some maybe, you know, I might have uh, done myself. Um, he, uh, he, let's see here. His blood, and his blood, sweat, and tears were used as a platform for others to express the very bigotry he had fought to overcome by coming, becoming so successful in this industry. So anyway, he becomes so successful and he starts to hear rumors about bad behavior in one of his stores in particular. So this is in uh, Soho, New York. So Darius decides that he will visit this store kind of undercover. He takes off his fine suits and puts on some jeans and a hoodie. I'll bet they were still really nice though. <laughs> and he just walks into one of these stores and uh, you know, no one, uh, he starts looking at watches and no one even acknowledges him or asks him if he could uh, use any help. Um, but finally the store manager comes up to him and says, um, you know, like, uh, what, what, what do you need here? Uh, Darius starts to handle a very nice leather bag that he's, he pretends to be interested in. And the store owner questions him and says, are you sure you could afford something like that? That probably isn't in your price range. If you can imagine someone saying to that to you, just based on your skin color, because what else did he know about him? First of all, this guy's a fool because he didn't know what his CEO looked like. <laughs> but, but anyway, to treat another human being based on assumptions, it was just skin color is, you know, just egregious. Um, he wanted to, uh, yeah, he presented himself as somebody completely different in the jeans and the hoodie. Um, it wasn't long before he realized that his undercover mission wasn't just about Ethan, the store manager. It was about confronting racism that had been a shadow over his whole life and his career, even when he thought he had outrun it. So think about the, the you know, extra level of coping that needs to be in place to not become discouraged, you know, from small being discriminated against in the classroom to the point where you're very successful, you're still dealing with it. It was about the unspoken belief that a black man didn't belong in certain spaces unless he had a platinum card to prove it. That's an ouch. Uh, no one acknowledged him, not even the security guard at the door nor the sales associates. 
They were all too busy fawning over a wealthy looking couple. So there are assumptions about everybody walking in that door, whether or not a salesperson would want to spend their time working with them. <clears throat> nice, huh? Um, he, he, Darius could feel the familiar sting of invisibility, the same sting he had felt in his youth, the sensation that wasn't new, but it was infuriating all the same. Uh, I just, I think that just to step out for a moment and talk about that invisibility is particularly injurious too, that that's one way to deal with your own uh, uh, internal um, assumptions about people of color, that you dismiss them, you make them invisible. I'm just not going to deal with it, right? This is something we have to watch for in ourselves. Um, anyway, he... Um, so let's see, I'm trying to figure out if the, yeah, he doesn't divulge to the store manager at the time who he is, but then the um, his assistant schedules a board meeting at that particular store, and then Darius Blackwall gets to walk in as a part of this team. He looks his store owner in the eyes, and the guy doesn't recognize him at first which is another little splash of racism. You know, he's not really seeing seeing the person in a way that you would, you know, have that recognition. Um, Ethan looked past the quality of Darius's clothing, the quiet confidence in his posture. None of that mattered in Ethan's, Ethan's eyes. Darius was a black man who didn't belong. Anyway, um, as, it, as the story goes on, um, he, Ethan asked him again, as I mentioned, is, are you sure this is in your price range? With condescension. I mean, that would make me so angry, I'd probably walk out. But I don't have these kind of coping strategies, right? Darius felt the jab, but he kept his cool. Years, having had years of enduring this kind of subtle racism that had made him adept at controlling his reactions. Still, it never got easier. Um, Darius could see the unease in the eyes of the sales associates nearby. They were watching too, but none of them stepped in the silent complicity that was all too familiar. It wasn't the first time that Darius had been kicked out of a store. He'd had dozens of experiences like that in his life, but he could feel his blood boiling and the desire to laugh out. Uh, rising within him, but this wasn't the moment for him. He had come here to see the truth for himself. So I accidentally jumped a little ahead in the story to talk about the board coming and him coming in as himself, the CEO of this company. Um, it, as he left the story, he says, it took every ounce of self-control not to march back into the store and reveal who he was at the moment. He knew he had to wait for the right moment. Then they bring in this board. And this, he, you know, reveals himself. He says, when Darius arrived, the difference in the store's atmosphere was palpable. Uh, you know, as he's entering the store as a CEO, the same staff who had ignored him the day before were now standing at attention, their smiles wide, their voices eager. Ethan was in the center of it all, barking orders like a drill sergeant, ensuring that every corner of the store sparkled. Then uh, Ethan, the store manager, begins to recognize Darius's face. This was a different man, a man worthy of respect, not the hoodie-clad stranger he had dismissed. I just think it's interesting how he parsed out two different human beings just based on clothes. Hmm just based on clothes. Mm -hmm. So um, Darius says, I've heard a lot about this location. He said in a smooth voice and, and he was calm. I wanted to see how things were running. Um, uh, you know, Ethan, the store manager, you know, starts to defend himself a little bit. You know, here our clients expect nothing but the best and we're sure to deliver. Um, but anyway, um, he hears about Darius shares this interesting experience. He says, you see, I came in looking for a new bag and I didn't quite get the warm uh, welcome I was expecting. You personally escorted me out of the store. 
Mm. That would be a horrible moment for any store manager to have to endure. Um, of course, Darius uh, savors the shift in power. Ethan must have felt horrible. But, you know, yeah, I always want to know, why did he feel horrible? Did he mm. feel ashamed of his behavior or did he recognize his own racism? Mm. So, Mavis, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back oh. and finish out your, your oh, okay. story. It's fine. All right. Yeah, yeah. We'll take a quick break and we'll just come right back. Okay. Welcome back to Inflection Point Podcast and our community conversations for 2024. In today's episode, we are discussing how the sting of invisibility can usher in the potential for justice in the workplace. So I'm going to pass the baton back over to Mavis so she can finish out the story that she was sharing. Great. Thanks, Anita. Um, like I say, there's so much more in this story, but uh, clearly Ethan, the store manager, uh, becomes contrite when the CEO walks in and said, it was me that you ushered out of your store yesterday. He said, I can explain. We've had issues with people coming in just to browse. And sometimes we have to be more selective with our attention. Nice try, right? <laughs> Darius <laughs> shook his head, cutting him off, saying, your selective attention, that's an interesting way to put it. Let me tell you something. You know, I've worked hard to build this company. I did it by believing that luxury isn't just for the wealthy elite. It's for anyone who values quality and is willing to invest in it. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, Ethan says, I made a mistake. I didn't re recognize you. I was wrong to treat you that way. Please give me another chance. Um, and Darius felt the weight of Ethan's words were hollow, but he still didn't fire him. He said, Dar Darius wasn't there to simply punish him. He was there to make sure that the lesson was learned, not just by Ethan, but by everyone there that that's what, that what we are going to do is treat people differently. Uh, to greet every single customer who walks in and offer to help them, give them the same level of service with a smile on your face. You're going to learn what it means to serve every customer with respect. So um, the story goes on, Darius uh, shakes his head. I didn't do it for the satisfaction. It was just exhausting. You know, this is the first, isn't the first time I've dealt with this, and it won't be the last. It's a statement, not just to Ethan, but to the rest of the staff and to the customers, you're showing them that this kind of behavior will not be tolerated. In that particular part, he's interacting with his assistant. But he's, uh, Darius says, we need to do more. I want to implement a company-wide diversity and inclusion program. Every manager, every staff member, Everyone needs to be on the same page about how we treat people regardless of their background. Um, he, uh, he, he had done what needed to be done, but it didn't erase the frustration that came with having to fight this battle again and again. Mm -hmm. So when I think about Darius being in this position, no matter how many times, he's still, still treated less than. There's not the, um, you know, the automatic respect that he deserves first as a human being and first, secondly, as a person who's shouldering the burden of managing this huge company. Um, he says no amount of success could fully shield him from the ugliness of prejudice. Mm -hmm. I know I've got a good line highlighted toward the end. Um, the change had taken root, you know, with this new DEI program, while the memory of what happened still lingered. He had done what was necessary for the company, and it was better for it. His He was building an empire to be a beacon of quality, excellence, and now it was also a beacon of something even more important, respect and dignity for all. So this Absolutely. was, a point, yeah, this was a point that he wanted to make. And I just thought that, you know, his whole reaction was so elegant and so, um, uh, you know, taking the high road, managing his own reaction, his own internal reaction to really despicable behavior. And he was still generous to the store manager and gave him another chance. Mm -hmm. so, any questions, comments? 
You were making some good ones a moment ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, did you have any comments? Yeah, go ahead. You can finish what you were, what you were starting to well, say. Well, yeah. So just kind of when you look at the store manager and this whole entire thing, uh, part of this conversation is what we have the potential to be when we come into a workspace, right? And mm -hmm. when you look at this customer who comes in clad in a hoodie, jeans, sneakers, the store manager was blind to the possibility that they could even afford to be in the store. In other words, you were very blind to the potential of that customer's financial status to be in a certain place so that they belonged in that store just like anybody else who would want to walk into that store. And I think one of the things with um, with the, the, um, the owner is that he's driving home this, this idea that says, it doesn't matter what a person looks like or what your interpretation of what they look, they still deserve. This is what I want. This is my store. They still to be yeah. deserve to be treated with the same respect and dignity without being hindered by your blindness. Right. Right. You know, right. I do, I do want to add something that I found in another article about invisibility Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, by a Jamaican woman who, whose parents were immigrants, and they were the people that worked with their hands. And the moment that they were seen with uniforms on, they became invisible in various ways, not deserving to be called by name and so on. And the last line in her article is, uh, she's, she's writing a book called This Great Hemisphere, Within it is a song, a song that so many of us, including our ancestors, have sung for centuries and will keep singing until our throats run dry. And that is the possibility of seeing each other, not in the dim, diminishing way we have become accustomed to, but in truer, more humane and radiant light. Absolutely. That is yeah, huh? Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah, that's beautiful. So um, just sort of moving into the last portion of the conversation, it's really looking at um, what the Center for Creative Leadership, how they define leadership as a social process that is driven by these three elements, direction, alignment, and commitment. And I'm very happy to say that I happen to be a, a on-call facilitator for the Center for Creative Leadership. So I'm very steeped in this idea of direction, alignment, and commitment is what leadership actually is. And when I look at both of the, um, the leaders and in each one of these stories, they both demonstrated that, right? Because what both of them did was observing a type of behavior that they saw within their organizations that they did not approve of. And what that um, insight gave them was the sort of this whole idea of that we need for this company to go in a specific direction. And that direction is moving away from this racialized way of interacting with one another and also interacting with potential customers and moving in a completely different direction. So that was the first thing that they both of them did was kind of looking and realigning the organization, if you will, right? So setting that initial direction that says, this is who we want to be as an organization. And then operating under the expectation that there would be alignment, meaning that the staff in the hospital, the doctor, the staff in the hospital, the expectation was there that they would position themselves to be in alignment with what this new direction is. Because the way the company was being operated was not the way that the overarching leadership wanted their company to go in that in that kind of direction. And so they changed the direction with the expectation that there would be alignment 
within the workforce, if you will, but not only the alignment, but also commitment. So I look at both of them as leading by example. And in their individual moments of that leadership, they I look at it as a moment of justice, right? A moment of justice in equity, diversity, and inclusion and moving their company, their respective organizations in that type of manner and making sure that everybody understood the expectation that there would be alignment and that there would be commitment. And so when you think about it, that's what I love about CCL's um, definition, that leadership is a social process because it's a process Mm -hmm. that involves multiple people aligning themselves directionally and being committed to the direction that they're uh, going in. And so I just find that to be so powerful. And one of the things that CCL says is, for all things humanly possible, a brighter future begins with the people who lead us there. And so it begins with the leadership. Right. And it's the that 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 beginning with that leadership and turning challenges into opportunities. Both instances, they were faced with a particular challenge. And in being faced with that challenge, made the choice to turn that into a different opportunity. Right. Hence the diversity, equity and inclusion uh, programs that they um, implemented within their uh, organization. And then finally, this idea that better leaders build a better world. And so when you have that level of leadership, like when you contrast that, these two stories uh, um, with other stories that we may have heard in the news recently where organizations, corporations have given in to stakeholders' demands that they not invest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've seen multiple stories lately where people literally turn back their diversity, equity, and inclusion work in response to these sponsors rather than looking at the harm that would be perpetrated by them continuing to operate in a in, in a space that allows for the possibility of racism to thrive. So to me, that's so powerful when leaders make those types of decisions, that direction, alignment, and commitment. Yeah, I just it's a qualitative decision. If you, you know, it's going to end up having a quantitative effect on the business. Absolutely. But address, address that. I'm just thinking how many leaders just say, you know, I I don't have time. Nobody has time to deal with that. People are just ugly sometimes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, they miss that opportunity that you're talking about to really make a change in their organization. Exactly. Exactly. And I think. Um, part of because of the way things are structured in under our capitalistic system, mm-hmm. that it's unfortunate that stakeholders or you know investors and those types of individuals are given more power than I think they yeah. sometimes deserve to oh, have. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. instead of looking at the power that I could have in terms of how I'm leading this organization in a way that brings us to a better future that is based on true equity, true diversity and true um, inclusion. Yeah. Uh, They have a chance to make a mark in the world overall, not just their industry, you know? Right, there is a commitment to being able to evaluate who is applying for jobs not based on the color of the skin, but based on on their ability to perform. But that means they have to include, right? They have to include people of color, people that are black. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And, and, and challenge those assumptions. Assumptions, yeah, that's what I was yeah, going to say. Challenge those yeah. assumptions, like 
it's so insulting to hear somebody say you're a DEI hire. Right. right. That's not what that was ever supposed to be meant for, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's belittling and it's insulting. Yeah. Extremely, extremely. But, but people continue to 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 I say believe that that's all it is. It's just hiring somebody that is the color of their skin. Right. Of, exactly. Exactly. Not because of their education, their or their background, their experience, and so forth. And that's not what exactly. that exactly their expertise, their professionalism. You're assuming that they don't have <clears throat> any of those qualities. Right. Wish you're that making they that see that as a signal to open up. What am I understanding here about this person? Mm -hmm. Why am I making this judgment? Mm -hmm. You know, open up to learning something new about a potentially very talented person. <laughs> right. But you you know how we always talk about the first step in you being able to do that is that you have to have a mindset of critical self-reflection. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to take a look at what are those internal uh, thoughts, beliefs, and ideas that I hold that are positioning me to be able to look at another individual in this type of life. Right. It also speaks to perspective taking. Do yes. I have the capacity within myself to step out of my own perspective and mm -hmm. actually listen for the purpose of understanding what all of this looks like through the eyes of another human being? Yes, yes, exactly. Not just being right about something, learning about something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's what the challenge is, right? And when I think about where we are and some of the things that we've been talking about, and we've been asking this question in terms of moving forward, where do you go from here? You meaning people out there who are listening to what we're talking about, where do you go? from here do you engage in that critical self-reflection to kind of get a deeper understanding of who you are and how you walk through the world and how are you interacting with pe people what are the assumptions you're making about people what are the blinders that you have on as you are encountering pe encountering people who look different from you where do you go in this precipice of change i think we're in that space i'm sorry I'm just saying it takes some effort. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. A little bit of effort. <laughs> absolutely. But we're in that look. space right now mm -hmm. where it is absolutely critical for people to begin to examine themselves and understand how cultivating change occurs from the inside out, especially yeah. this level of change that we're looking for at this precipice at this moment in time, I should say. Right. People have to be willing to look at themselves. Nothing Honestly. Change with it unless they do that. We, know, exactly. not, because we have to change our beliefs in order to change our behavior and our, and our thoughts and feelings. We have to change that belief, those beliefs. So we must take a different perspective. Look. Exactly. Exactly. It's so doable. there's a, Oh, yeah, definitely. It's doable. doable. <laughs> Look at us. We're doing it. Look at us. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but there's a incredible spoken word artist that I just got exposed to mm. recently. Her name is Hosanna <clears throat> Wong. And she's a woman of God. And so she does this spoken word um, piece that's called I Have a New Name. And it's about walking in your true identity. And I think when you take that piece and connect it back to the coping strategies that both of these individuals had in these respective environments, it was about you having a handle on your true identity, right? So you'll be called incompetent. You'll be called um, a DEI hire. You'll be, you'll be called, you don't belong here. All of these names that you will be called as a result of you being associated in somebody's mind 
in a certain way or perceived in somebody's mind in a certain way. And she wrote this beautiful piece. I have a new name, right? My name is not incompetent. Right? Say her name again, Anita. My what name was is not incompetent. But I mean, my name, her name is name not. So oh, the woman. Sorry, <laughs> I, I got caught up. <laughs> we got it. We I got, got caught up. up. <laughs> Our name is Hosanna Wong. H -O Hosanna Wong. Yeah, okay. H O S A N N A Wong. Excellent. Thank and you. The piece is called "I Have a New Name." Oh, it's so and powerful. The, yeah. The bottom line summary of the whole entire piece is you are who God says you are. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. You are who God says you are. <laughs> That's right. And if you can walk in that, right. in that kind of power, mm -hmm. you know, in the Bible where it talks about putting on the full armor of God, you put that on your mind, your body, you wear that as a symbol of you knowing who you are. I am powerful. I am empowered. I am a woman. I'm a Proverbs 31 woman. That's who I am. And when you go into the workplace and you have these experiences where people are calling you out of your name, that's what the challenge is. That's what the challenge is and this precipice of change where we actually are. And so the call to action here is to stay woke in this period of time and be prepared to vote. And woke is an acronym for us. Woken is, is an acronym for well-informed, open-minded, kind, and empathetic. And being prepared to vote means we're raising voices organized to empower right? And so we're literally just about out of time. So I'd like to leave our audience with this final quote that actually comes from Hosanna Wong, mm. right? We will not rebuild our cities and restore our communities if we're comparing what is in front of us to what is in front of someone else. Critiquing how someone else is building instead of looking at what God has given us to build is the surefire way to guarantee that nothing gets built. And so I look at that quote within the context of all of this stuff and ask the audience to think about in what area has God given you authority and how are you using your position, your leadership position as a weapon for cultivating change. And then of course, we always relate this back to the Cairo question. Will Cairo have to protest in his lifetime for the birthright to freely and peacefully um, exist in the skin in which he was born? So what, you, what will you do to ensure that Cairo and his contemporaries have that birthright to freely and peacefully exist in the skin in which they were born? So I'll leave you with those final words and thank you so much for joining us on Inflection Point Podcast here on Transformation Talk Radio. We are here every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time as we continue our community conversations and we'll see you at the next episode. Thank you for listening to Inflection Point Podcast, where our mantra is cultivating change from the inside out. The journey towards anti-racism and social change doesn't stop here. Truth, reconciliation, and healing come from ongoing, open, honest, and deliberate conversations. Continue to dive in and deconstruct your thoughts, ideas, and beliefs as we band together to manifest social change. Tune in to Inflection Point Podcast every first and third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern here on TransformationTalkRadio.com for more conversations about how we can cultivate change from the inside out.